Western Pennsylvania spotlight story of this week takes us to the 1969 Pittsburgh Steelers NFL draft class as a, one of their greatest classes ever where they built a strong foundation that built a dynasty. Hear about these picks and more stories in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And it is the weekend, and we're going to talk about some more Western Pennsylvania football history. And with us getting closer and closer to the draft, it's coming up in just a few days after the release of this podcast. It's on the horizon, and mock drafts as well as polls on the greatest picks and draft classes of all time are rampant all across the web. And one such one that comes up quite a bit is the remarkable franchise-changing draft of the 1974 Steelers. Now, it was truly amazing and probably the best rookie class any NFL team has ever had or will ever have. Now, our friend and fellow Sports History Network partner, author and historian Joe Zagorski, always has some brilliant insights and stories from the 1970s era of pro football. And recently, Joe posted a story remembering that great 1974 Pittsburgh Steelers NFL draft. Like we said, hands down, it's probably the best draft and rookie class ever with five total Hall of Famers coming out of it. You know, when you had Lynn Swan, Jack Lambert, John Stallworth, and Mike Webster all drafted, and then an unrestricted free agent, Donnie Shell picked up, all five are in the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Now, I'm going to let Joe uh, tell you about it. We have a link to his great Sports History Network uh, podcast, Pro Football in the 1970s, and it's titled The Incredible Rookie Class of the 1974 Pittsburgh Steelers. But that's not what this podcast is about. We're going to talk about another draft class that's probably almost just as important. That's the one that really put the Steelers dynasty over the edge. Well, there had to be something done uh, to be built in the the foundation of a dynasty. And that 1970s foundation is probably the 1969 uh, draft of the Pittsburgh Steelers, the first one that Chuck Noll and company were involved in. And here the Steelers built the cornerstones of Steeler football in the trenches with the big guys in there. And the Steelers had the top pick in that draft in 1969, and they really made it count because the first pick, we said in the trenches, well, how about the number one pick being Mean Joe Green, a former defensive tackle from North Texas State. But Joe Green was pretty much known as a nice guy off the field, but he was tabbed with the mean part of his nickname by the mascot of the North Texas State being called the Mean Green. Now, North Texas with Joe in the lineup allowed less than two yards per carry in the 29 games from 1965 through the 1968 season, and Joe was a consensus All-American in college football in 1968. The Pittsburgh Steelers used that number one pick in the 69 draft to bring the six foot four, 275 D lineman to the Steel City, and the Steelers were rewarded in this selection by Green becoming an NFL Rookie of the Year for the 1969 season. In his 13 year career, he went to 10 Pro Bowls and was the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year in both 1972 and 1974's season. In 1972, it was really special for Joe as he recorded five of his 11 season-high sacks in a crucial must-win game against the Houston Oilers to propel the Steelers into their first playoff game ever in franchise history. The Steelers, and a couple of years later, won the first of four Super Bowls with big number 75, anchoring the famed Steel Curtain defense. Now, Joe Green was enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1987 and a College Football Hall of Fame in 1984. But how could you follow that up with anything better? Well, you can't, but you can get pretty close. You can get some really good talent. The second round, which the Steelers had, pick number 30, uh, they turned around and grabbed a top quarterback prospect next in Terry Hanratty out of Notre Dame. Now, Hanratty eventually would push the top pick of the following season, Terry Bradshaw, for the starting job under center. And also a competition with a later quarterback that we picked up in Joe Gilliam. 
that that uh, triumvirate of quarterbacks was epic. And that quarterback room really had a lot of talent in it, and any one of them could have been some great starters. We all know Bradshaw ended up winning out and taking that position. He was a 1970 draft pick, so we're not going to talk about him right now. But Terry Hanratty uh, stayed with the Steelers through the 1975 season. And then uh, the 1976, he played with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who were an expansion team that year. I believe they picked Henry Addy up in the expansion draft, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that was his final year, was 1976, with those uh, those Buccaneers teams. But Henry Addy, you know, what a resume and uh, you know, quite the accomplished uh, quarterback there up in South Bend uh, with the Golden Domers uh, playing some some great football for them. And he played some great football for the Steelers as well. You know, his career uh, was, uh, you know, not the the great ones of the Steelers, but he had an eight-year career, and he ended up having 165 completions uh, for 2,510 yards, 24 touchdowns, 35 interceptions. Uh, uh, Just, uh, you know, just a a journeyman quarterback, you know, second string, but he did have some few great starts there in the early 70s for the Steelers when they were battling for uh, to see who their signal caller of the future would be and the now they had another second round pick pick number 42 and the Steelers took a name that maybe not a lot of people are familiar with Warren Bankston a running back from Tulane was the next selection for Pittsburgh not bad either as Warren stayed in the league for 10 seasons four with the Steelers and then six more in Oakland with the Raiders which were also a pretty good team in the 1970s. So Warren Bankston really knew how to uh, play football. And he was, you know, wasn't always a starter either. Uh, he ended up ha- playing 114 uh, games, though, total in his career and had 684 yards rushing for his career, three touchdowns, and uh, 38 receptions for 283 yards. But I uh, played behind some really good running backs. You know, the Steelers ended up getting Franco Harris uh, a few years later. And we know how good the backs were out there in, uh, in Oakland when he played with them. But he was a, a spot starter. Uh, could, could come in and give guys a, a break and probably played a lot of special teams uh, for both the Steelers and the Raiders. Well, the third round pick, the Steelers pick, chose at number 56, and the offensive line was now a priority, and the Steelers grabbed a pretty good one there, too. John Kolb, a tackle from Oklahoma State, joined the franchise and stayed with the club as a key piece in the offensive line for 13 seasons. Yeah, John Kolb really anchored, helped anchor that line, you know, along with, uh, you know, Mike Webster and uh, Larry Brown and uh, some of the others that were just uh, tremendous picks. Uh, but John Kolb, really, he was a solid one. When you can get 13 seasons out of an offensive lineman picked in the third round, you know you did yourself pretty well, and uh, you did a lot of blocking. But just think about how good Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer were. Uh, the one season, they ended up both earning 1,000 yards rushing during regular season in 14-game seasons, mind you. So that tells you the offensive line was clicking and working together, and they had some, some boys up there that could to move the pile a little bit, and uh, the running backs could find some holes. John Kolb was definitely one of those. So another 13-season uh, player out of that draft pick and the foundation of the offensive line, just like Joe Green, 13 seasons on the defensive line. Well, the next few picks had some limited success. You know, Bob Campbell, he played uh, for part of the 1969 season, and Bob was a wide receiver out of Penn State. You know, a local product, uh, but you know, didn't really find the team. You know, with the team the next season, and the Steelers really weren't that good in 1969, even though they had this great talent. Uh, Chuck Beatty uh, came from North Texas, the teammate of uh, Joe Green down there. Uh, you know, just a great defensive back that ended up playing. Uh, and he uh, ended up playing in the NFL for a total of four seasons uh, there. Uh, next couple picks were Chadwick Brown and Joe Cooper. They both had a cup of coffee in camp and they were gone. Uh, Joe, John Sadowski, a linebacker from Villanova, played with the Steelers for a year and then went back home to play two more seasons with the Philadelphia Eagles. Of course, Villanova... Uh, their home is in Philadelphia. Philadelphia Eagles was a natural choice for him when he left the Steelers. Well, the next two picks came from the same small school, Arc Pine Bluff. Well, you might say, where is Arc Pine Bluff? Well, it's an HBCU school, 
down in Arkansas. Actually, their former name is the formal name is the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. And no doubt, uh, this was Super Scout Bill Nunn and his amazing nose for talent that looking down there in those HBCU schools uh, that played a hand in these great decisions. L.C. Greenwood and Clarence Washington, those were the next two picks for the Steelers. They were both from the defensive line of Arcpine and became uh, Steelers with the picks in the 10th and the 11th rounds. And L.C. Greenwood would go on to play uh, same line with uh, Joe Green for, again, another one, 13 seasons on that defensive line and uh, part of the Steel Curtain defensive line. And unofficially, Elsie Greenwood had 78 sacks and 14 fumble recoveries. Not too shabby indeed there. And, you know, the, the Steelers then went on to a bunch of guys that really didn't stick around too much. Doug Fisher played two years. He was their next pick in the 12th round, San Diego State. And then they had a bunch of guys that uh, were just sort of camp bodies. John Lynch from Drake. Bob Hounard, uh, running back from Ohio. Uh, Ken Liberto, a wide receiver from Louisiana Tech. Doc Mosley from Alcorn State. And Bill Ekrept, a kicker from Kent State, uh, was 17th round draft pick. Remember, the draft went 17 to 20 rounds back then. Really had a lot of draft picks. So not a lot of guys got opportunities to play. That's why there was a lot of, were just camp bodies. But you pick up three, one guy that's in the Hall of Fame already, Joe Green, 13 seasons. Terry Hanratty played for your team for seven seasons and another year with another team. Uh, Warren Bankston played four years as a Steeler, six uh, with the uh, Oakland Raiders. John Kolb, 13 seasons. Uh, Elsie Green with 13 seasons. And, you know, so you're, you got 39 years on, of starts on your defensive and offensive lines just in that draft. That's why I say it's a great foundational draft for the dynasty of the Pittsburgh Steelers. That's where they built uh, as Chuck Noll wanted to do in the eyes of uh, his uh, former mentor, Paul Brown, he built the trenches up first. Those offensive defensive lines made them solidified and stellar and long lasting with great talent in Green, Greenwood, and John Kolb. And uh, fantastic. Then the other drafts that came after that were the icing on the cake, like that 74 draft. And even the next year when they got Bradshaw in the 1970 draft and Franco Harris a few years later and really built that team through the draft. At one point in the 70s when the Steelers were winning Super Bowls, they every single player on their roster was a draft pick of the Steelers. There was nobody from another team that was on some of those teams. So that just tells you how important the draft was to the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, back in the 1970s to build a dynasty through the draft. So we're glad that you were able to join us for some more great history on Western Pennsylvania football. And we bring you football history from all around uh, each and every day here on PigskinDispatch.com. Hope you'll join us back tomorrow for some more great history. And until then, have a great gridiron day. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? you should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, Check out the 1963 Vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. 
Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order.